Okay, you're, you're, you're ready to go now. <laughs> Excellent. Hello, Do everyone. Do-over. Yay. Welcome to Kiss Your Spring Quarter 2020. This is another um, episode or edition or live broadcast of Lifeboat Strategies for Faculty. And our warm-up question today is brought to you by our facilitator, Andy Zamora, and we're going to introduce her in just a few moments. But if you could please type your response into the chat, what are you most nervous about in making the transition to online teaching? And again, um, as we sort of read through your responses, this helps us kind of get a sense of where folks are at and also helps us kind of think about how can we inform future professional development? Uh, not that we've ever done professional development in a pandemic before. Um, hopefully we never have to do this again, but I think it's helpful to know just where folks are at right now. Uh, so today's facilitator is Andy Zamora, communications faculty at Bellingham Technical College, and she has an impressive CV, and Joe Monroe, uh, who has known her for a long time, is going to do her introduction. And I'm going to try to do her justice. Um, <laughs> I, I want to say that, first of all, um, Andy's whip smart, personable, and kind, and a good communicator, which one would hope from a communications faculty. Um, I, I know Andy from way back. Um, we, we were colleagues in an in interdisciplinary studies department. I had the honor to be the chair of that department when she was um, a brilliant adjunct there for a couple of years and then of course she went on with her life <laughs> and I went on with my life and um, I just want to say that um, the kind of communitarian she is there was a there is a, a, a Facebook group that we put together sort of as an emergency response that I'm a moderator for um, and it's bringing together folks who are doing exactly what she's sharing with you today and I wasn't the one who invited her into that space, but we met each other again in that space where she was contributing and it was really a joyful connection. And after that, I found out that not only had she been doing the same um, work that she had been doing for a number of years, she's worked um, really um, as an adjunct in our uh, system for what, like 15 years. I, I mean, you, yep, she's saying yes. And um, she was, I guess, not challenged enough. So in addition to homeschooling her children, <laughs> she- Which Everyone's uh, doing now, so yeah. <laughs> it's no big deal. So that's I mean, like the perfect experiential moment. She um, went back and got a second master's and that second master's is in adult and higher education. And as part of that, she also did graduate work for three years, I think, Andy, I'm not sure, um, at the Center for, in, uh, here, I knew I was gonna mess up, um, at the Center for Instructional Innovation at um, Western Washington University. And so she's bringing that with her. Now she's just completed her tenure so congratulations and Thank has three quarters release time to work in a professional development so we were talking um the other day and saying all the stars have aligned um the most important thing for this session though i think is that she's just a, a, she's an instructor who rocks the classroom and so uh i'm ready to learn uh and i i know that she'll help us all to move forward go ahead andy Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joanne. Um, I'm nervous to live up to that. Jen, any other introductory stuff that you want to do to set the Stage. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly that um, the reason that we are offering these sessions is just to let folks know you are not alone. Um, we really want you to be inspired and give you hope that you can do this and that this might not actually be as bad as you thought. Um, then that I think learning how to be an effective instructor in an online environment will give you great transferable skills that you can bring to your face-to-face -face classroom when we return to some semblance of normalcy. And 
really the goal of this of this session is to just get you ideas to just get your first and second week up online and running and we know that teachers learn best from other teachers and we also know that they learn from good examples and so today we've asked Andy to give you a really good example <laughs> an exceptional example of an online course um, so Joe Monroe, who just introduced um, Andy, and Alyssa Sells, our e-learning professional development expert, and me, Jen Wetham, will be monitoring the chat. So we're going to have Andy present. We're going to ask her questions. Uh, we'll stop her when they pertain to what her is discussing. I just saw that. <laughs> I used to teach English. Uh, what her is discussing. That's great. Um, <laughs> and if you have a general Canvas question, we'll post a link into the chat. Um, and the next steps, if you would like to be recorded, the, if you'd like to be emailed the link to this recording directly, please just type your email into the chat. And that's all my housekeeping issues. Uh, Joe and Alyssa, anything else you want to add before we get started? Nope. All right, Andy, take it away. Okay, um, so I'm gonna try to screen share and start there. Okay. So um, I wanted to start kind of at the very beginning of the process a little bit um, so that people can kind of get a sense for um, what it looks like to design a class online. Um, first, I want to say I read an article um, yesterday um, that talked about how emergency remote learning is completely different from intentional online learning. Um, and I think it's really important to keep that in mind, um, that good enough is gonna be good enough. And I'll talk about that a little bit as we go. Um, I've actually been teaching online for quite a few years, so I'm not doing a huge amount of shifting um, to start this from scratch. Um, but I know it can be really overwhelming if you are kind of starting from scratch. And so I just want to first reiterate that uh, one of the, the phrases that this article used was instructional MacGyvers, that we're all kind of having to um, work with what we have and do the best we can in a very quick uh, turnaround time. And so um, give yourself a lot of grace, and I'll come back to that again later. Um, one of the things that I think is really essential, especially in an emergency situation, is focusing on backward design, um, which is getting really, really um, narrowed down to what is nece necessary and essential um, and what uh, isn't, because you won't be able to recreate the classroom online. It's going to have to be a little bit different. And so getting really clear about what you want your st students to know and understand, really starting with that end goal in mind. Most of us have um, course outcomes that we need to meet. And so that's kind of that starting benchmark. Um, but then thinking not about the activities, but the assessments first. So what is it that students can do, even from a remote space, to be able to show you what they've learned, um, to be able to prove that they've met those outcomes. So really thinking in terms of what can I have students do to show me that they're learning and then figuring out what kinds of materials or activities or um, things, tools that you can give them that will help them develop those skills that they need to then demonstrate to you. Um, so really kind of taking this in a, a backwards design sort of model. Um, got notes, so I'm kind of referring to those a little bit. Um, and one of the things that I also think is really essential is um, don't try to reinvent the wheel. So a lot of this is going to be using materials you already have. If you show videos in class, those are going to be useful um, in an online environment. Um, you can upload handouts that you have, and those can be files in Canvas courses. Um, you can add audio to PowerPoint slides that you already use, save it as an MP4, it gets uploaded to YouTube, and that becomes a video lecture. Um, so it doesn't have to be a lot of reinventing the wheel. Um, and then Canvas Commons is also a really great place, and I'm sure someone will post a link in the chat about how to get to Canvas Commons. We can look at that later if we have time. Um, but you can borrow modules, assignments, um, content pages, sometimes even entire courses on Canvas Commons from colleagues around the country that are already doing a lot of these activities. Um, hey, Andy. So, Andy. Yes. So sorry, this is Jen Wetham. So sorry. Yeah. Um, do you mind just for the sake of the recording, just putting your slides into presentation mode? Yeah. 
Yep, I gotta minimize this for a second. Sorry, thank no, you. No, it's okay, it's okay. I'm trying to figure out where the present button has gone. That's not it. One of the things that I thought was most useful about my instructional technology class was seeing the instructor of an instructional technology class fumble a little bit, <laughs> which reminded me that things go wrong, but they're still okay. We so love <laughs> I'm actually having a really hard time finding. Then so do not worry about it. Absolutely. Just keep going. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And I think you're totally right. Like we all make mistakes with tech, no matter how experienced we are. So thanks for modeling so graciously. And it might I, be under slide or under slide? view. It's funny because there's usually a little button and I don't know if okay. it's because Try it's under view there. and see if it's under that one. Oh, there, it is. there it is. Present. Okay. It okay. also takes a village with yep. tech. Totally. It totally does. And a lot of times you'll find out that your students actually know more than you do. Um, and so if they know how to fix something, by all means, let them fix it for you. because <laughs> um, They'll be able to fix it a lot of times. Okay. Are we good so far? Yes. We're ready? Okay. Um, okay. So that's kind of background, just um, instructional design kind of theory and also letting you know that um, you don't have to start from scratch entirely. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of people out there that can help that already have activities ready to go. Um, and then in terms of actually building the class or putting it together, and I'm going to kind of switch back and forth from the slides to my Canvas class to show you some things. Oh, and now I don't know how to move through the slides. Oh. I have to just click on them. Okay. Um, so uh, the first thing that I would do if I was starting from scratch to put a course together is build a basic outline. Um, decide which topics you're going to try to cover in which weeks um, and then build modules. I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Um, and for now, those modules are just placeholders. They're just like a file folder. You don't need to fill them up yet. Um, and you can use the lock until now I got to figure out how to get out of this presentation mode. Escape. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch over here so I can show you what I mean. So we're in student view in my course. Um, <clears throat> and I'll show you some of the other things on the home page in a minute, but I want to just show you modules real quick because I think the first thing to do is to build modules like file folders. So I'm going to just minimize them so that you can see just the structure. Um, and you'll see this one is lighter gray because one of the things that I do, and I, I have my course fully ready to go because I've been teaching it. Most of you won't. Um, you're gonna focus on just getting your first two weeks up and then you're gonna be building the rest as you go. And that's totally okay. Um, all of us started that way, right? Just being a week ahead of our students, that's totally okay. Um, and so what the modules do for now is just give you a placeholder. And what I do, even though it's totally ready to go, I don't want my students to have access to everything right away. I want them to kind of pace together a little bit because so much of the class is discussion based. And so I use lock until. So you'll see this is locked until um, a certain date and it, it, they're a week out from each other. And so students can see basically what's going to be in the module, but they can't interact with anything. They can't click on it. So I can go in and make whatever changes I want, and it's not going to affect anything that they've seen. Um, if you don't want even this level, you can just leave them unpublished. Um, I'm going to leave student view for a second so you can see the background of what it looks like from the instructor side. Um, and so you can just leave them unpublished until you're ready to students and that's k2 um, i like to give them the basic structure so they know what's coming even though they don't know the details of it <clears throat> even if all it is is a topic um, but you can just leave them unpublished here um, if you want to lock it the way to do that real quick let me go down here to this one um, is you'll just edit the module and click this lock until button and then give it whatever date you want to give it all the way to a time. Um, and I have mine locked, like I said, so that I can keep students at basically the same pace with each other. Um, and I think that's really helpful for their discussions. Um, how are we doing? Are there any questions that came up in the chat? Not at this moment. Okay, I can't see the screen sharing on. I had one thing I observed when you opened up your course, Andy, yeah. uh -huh. that it says no ordinary quarter 
And I just thought that was cool. <laughs> yes. So I'll talk about that in just a second. I'm going to go back to this, the slides for a second. Um, <clears throat> So again, building modules and leave them as a placeholder, use lock and tell or unpublish, um, and then focus on just building a solid first two weeks. Um, and then the second thing that I would do, even before I'm populating those modules, um, is to um, keep in mind that I'm gonna try to build everything in modules as a central location, and then remove as many extra navigation links as you possibly can, um, just to kind of streamline where students go. So I pull out, and I'll go back to student view again, um, I pull out pretty much all of the navigation links except um, the ones that are really, really essential. Um, and even in my face to face classes, I use Canvas. And so one of the mantras that I say over and over in classes, everything lives in modules. So when you click on Canvas, everything lives in modules. I do use the syllabus. And so I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, but pretty much everything lives in modules. There's a question corner, they can check their grades, they can find people. Um, and then these are all sort of help related things that are um, specific to uh, BTC and the college that I work at. Um, but they can't access discussions, they can't access assignments, they can't access pages without going through modules first. Um, and that just keeps everything in one easy to find location. Um, and it also helps them to be able to see like, okay, these are the, the lessons, these are the learning pages, and these are the assignments that are related to them. So when I'm doing these assignments, this is the information that I'm probably gonna draw from. And it just keeps it all um, really tidy. Uh, it also helps prevent them a little bit, not entirely, but a little bit, um, from just jumping ahead to the assignments without looking through the material and the lessons first. Because um, I've, I've noticed that that's definitely something that they do. They still can do that if they just go to their to-do list, um, which shows up over here. They'll, oh, I have this assignment, and they'll just click on it. Um, but one of the things that I've done, especially in the first week or two, to try to preempt that um, is to provide a note. If you haven't already worked through the module for this week in order and have just skipped ahead to this assignment, you'll need to go back and watch those lessons before you'll have the information you need. Um, so that just gives them that reminder that they need to go to the modules and read through things there. Um, Andy, so modules really is where everything lives. Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, before you uh, before you leave, we do have a question from Betsy Berger. How did you make the question corner? Um, yeah, so question corner really is just a page. Um, and this is actually a tip that I picked up on a lifeboat strategy session last week. Um, was uh, you can create, I know, right? I've been doing this a while and I picked up a cool tip. tip. So um, Question Corner is actually just a page that I've created as a navigation link. So I'll click on it real quick so you can see it. So it's just a page in Canvas um, that gives students um, how do I get help and some FAQs. And so I tell them, look in the syllabus, um, scroll to the bottom for some FAQs. I build a questions for the instructor discussion board that's linked to from here, um, a link to my Zoom virtual office hours, um, other places to get help where I talk about some of those other links. Um, and then what you do, I'm gonna have to leave student view to show you how to do this. Um, but you'll go down to settings. And from settings, you'll click apps. And once you have the page built, you use the redirect tool, which is this little blue arrow here. Um, and you're gonna add an app and then you can name it whatever you want. I called it question corner. Uh, part two, just so it, whatever. Um, and then you find the link to that page, uh, which I didn't copy while I was still there, but you'd find the link to that particular page, um, which you just copy from the, the course link. And then you click show in course navigation. And then when you click add app, it becomes an option in your navigation bar. Um, and all it really does is redirect them to that specific um, Web link. So then when you go to navigation, it becomes one of these P 
pieces that you can move around. Um, I did the same thing uh, creating a counseling and COVID-19 resources page for my students um, that I also added as a navigation link using that redirect tool. Um, the one caution is that it because it is a, a specific link, you'll have to update that link for each course, um, including from year to year or if you're copying from course to course because if you um, try to use it in section B, after you created it in section A, it's gonna to try to send students to the link in section A. So you'll need to actually update that um, every new course, uh, but that's a pretty quick and easy thing to do. And, and Andy, while you're looking at that, uh, the page there where you added the counseling and COVID-19 resources, um, I wanted you to keep in mind that one of the framing questions in the chat was about how you, um, address the affective dimension in your mm -hmm. courses. And so it just seemed timely to notice that that seems like one way of, of uh, addressing that. I mean, unless it's directly related to your curriculum, it seems like you're doing something there to address the effect affective dimension and I didn't mm. want to let go of it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, there's actually quite a bit that I do um, around building community and building presence, um, partly because of the nature of the topic that I teach, um, partly because of who I am as a person, um, but there's quite a bit that I do in regards to that. And so I'll touch on some of those other things as well. Um, let me pull this up and make sure. Okay, so um, if I go back to my, oh, yeah, it's screen sharing makes it more difficult to go from tab to tab. My, can I move this bar? Ah, ha, ha, ha. I don't know if you can see that, but I just figured out how to move a bar out of the way so I can click my tabs easier. Okay, um, so uh, removing any extra navigation links is what I just talked about. And then um, developing a clear home page that will send students straight to that module. So I think it's really essential for them to have a a landing page. Um, some faculty just use the modules as their home page and that can work really well too. Um, for me though, I really like to have a landing page to um, start doing some of that uh, instructor presence and community building so that there's a solid place that they land. Um, and I'll also update it with announcements every week. And one of the things that I'm making sure to do, oops, that I'm making sure to do this quarter is, um, doing some of those announcements with video. Um, one of the things that I, I recognize is that I'm gonna have a lot of students this quarter who did not select into online classes. So our college teaches um, both face-to-face -face and online versions of this class, um, but this quarter students aren't gonna have the option to take it face-to-face. -face. They're gonna have to take it online even if they wouldn't have wanted to. And so I'm thinking even more about ways to build that presence. Um, and I've traditionally just done announcements with a, a funny little meme and then some written announcements and I'm going to stick with that but I'm also going to add some videos in um, so that they can see my face and hear my voice and do some of that connecting. Um, and I'll show you more with the homepage and modules in a minute. Um, one of the other things that I do is establish a really predictable <laughs> rhythm for the class. I call it the Canvas Week. So our, co our um, college typically starts the quarter on a Tuesday and so uh, the Canvas Week goes from Tuesday morning to Monday night and I post a new announcement for the week on Tuesday morning, and then I have deadlines consistent every week. So deadlines are always Saturday at midnight and Monday at midnight. Um, Saturday is usually the deadline for posting your initial discussion posts because there's a discussion pretty much every week in my communication studies class. Um, and then Monday is the day to complete any written assignments or quizzes that might be uh, relevant from that week. And that um, predictable rhythm for students um, once they get into that after about two weeks is a, makes it a lot easier for them to stay engaged and um, know when deadlines are coming. Um, and then I also give them a weekly overview with a checklist every week so that they know exactly what they need to do. Um, so first week, um, what are some things that you want to be focusing on? And a lot of it is using low stakes activities to um, provide some orientation for students and create presence. So I'm going to uh, not read all the things from these slides. I'm going to just go through them really, really quickly and then go over to my Canvas course so I can show you how I'm doing some of this. Um, but one of the things that you want to orient them to is you, creating your sense of teacher presence, letting them know that um, there is a human out there that is um, interested, that is um, 
responsive to them, that they're not just uh, behind a box all by themselves. Um, so you'll see things that I'll show you in just a minute about profile and uh, about the instructor page, um, creating video announcements. You can even create video or audio feedback in SpeedGrader, um, which is a tool that I use, especially if students have used audio or video in their submission. I'll respond to them with an audio or video comment. Um, and then being really quick and responsive, especially in the first two weeks when students have questions or submit assignments. Um, so I'm going to go over to my class and show you some of that stuff real quick. <clears throat> so, and I'm going to go into student view so that you'll see what it looks like from student perspective. Um, so when they uh, first come to the class, when they first land on it, um, this is what they'll see. So um, they'll have a welcome. There'll be a welcome video message from me. Um, a reminder that this class is not self-paced. That's usually the first thing that we need to um, make sure students are aware of. Um, our college requires a check-in by the end of the second day to not be dropped. I don't know how um, strict they'll be with that this quarter, but just in case, I always have a stop message, do this first, um, and then come back and click the start button to get started. And this just takes them to the modules. Um, I always start with a um, welcome start here module. So this isn't content, this is just um, sort of the kinds of orientation things that we would normally do on the first day of class in a face-to-face -face class. So um, it starts with just some really basic what to expect kinds of things. Um, and tells them what they'll figure out or what they'll learn in this, uh, this section of the, the course. So I give them a little bit of information about course navigation. Um, and some of it is really, really simple. So I start with even things like reminding them, especially this quarter when we have a lot of um, students who aren't used to learning online, that anything in blue is a hyperlink. Um, and I give them a little try it now. This is just a Imagine you're in a hammock for a minute because it takes you away for just a second <laughs> from all the chaos. Um, give them sort of a, a structure for what the course is going to look like. Introduce them to that Canvas week rhythm. Um, explain to them what modules are like and that each module they'll find, again, a predictable rhythm of things. So every module starts with an overview and to-do list. So it's a checklist of what they're going to do. There'll be a few lesson pages and then um, a couple of activities or assignments. Almost every week includes at least one discussion, one assignment, and one quiz. That does change a little bit from week to week, depending on what's going on. But um, basically, there are um, a few lesson pages and then about three activities for them to do. Um, and then I tell them where they can ask questions and remind them that they can use Next to navigate. I want them using Next anytime they possibly can um, to navigate from one page to the next so that they're going in the order that I've presented it, just like I would in class. Okay, Joe, here's your no ordinary quarter thing that you noticed. Um, this is one of the things that I added just for this quarter um, that I think is an important way to, again, help establish some instructor presence and build some community. Um, and I think it's really important to just uh, acknowledge the context for a minute um, that this is not a normal time and space for anybody and that all of us are coping with it in our own ways and that we all need a little bit of grace from each other. Um, that that means that instructors are overwhelmed at being MacGyvers right now and students are overwhelmed at having to take classes online in ways that they never really wanted to. Um, and so what I created was just a discussion board for them to talk about that if they want. It's completely optional. Um, they don't have to, but it also directs them to some of those resources and links um, to an article about um, grief response responses, and then just gives them a space to vent if they need to, get um, support if they need to. Um, and my plan is that in the first week, I'll post um, a post that talks a little bit about some of my thoughts and, and kind of where I'm at right now um, to kind of set the tone and model that for students and give them that, that space. Um, while we're talking about it, I'll real quick click on this um, counseling and COVID-19 resources just so you can see what that looks like. Um, so I mentioned counseling being available at BTC. Um, this is actually a, a link that I always have. Um, the nature of what I teach in interpersonal communication can sometimes bring up um, memories or thoughts or um, ideas about 
their own relationships or things that are going on in their life. And so I always have a link to um, counseling resources, but I've also added COVID-19 this quarter, um, given the circumstances and the situation. So um, this just gives them a bunch of links for different places, reminder about BTC alerts and um, ways to stay connected to what's going on on campus. Andy, in the chat, yeah. Dean is asking you if you can provide an e or email the language that you've used there in your It's No Ordinary Quarter page uh, because she thinks it looks really good. Yeah, um, so I'll go ahead and share it to Canvas Commons. Let me write myself a note here. Um, and then you should be able to search for it in Canvas Commons um, under my name or under No Ordinary Quarter, um, and then import that straight into your class. And it'll just be, you can do whatever you'd like with it. It'll just be there. Um, this link will be broken though, because you won't have that unless you build that page for yourself. So um, you'll have to fix that link, but everything else should work just fine. Hey, Andy, would you yeah. mind, would you mind Mm -hmm. um, and, and also my, my co-facilitators feel free to be like, Jen, that's a bad idea. Don't do it. But could you show people how to access the Canvas Commons through your instance of Canvas? Because I think it's always helpful for folks to just see it. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Okay, so I'm going to leave student view. And we also have a request for you to share your getting started module <laughs> as well. Okay. Um, it's pretty personalized, but I'll share it. Okay. So um, settings is usually where I start um, for importing things from commons. Um, and that's also where you can share things to commons. But so you'll click import, import course content. Um, and why is commons not? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I remember over here. Commons mm -hmm. is over here in the gray bar. It's been, you know, a couple days since I've done this. Okay, so um, click on Commons in this gray bar over here. Apparently my internet is a little slow today. Gives you time to breathe. It does, yep. Joe, that's um, a great idea. We should all start breathing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually shared a project on deliberate listening. Um, so I'll just pull that up. Um, but you can search all kinds of things. Let's, let's not pull up that one in particular. Let's just look for a project on listening. Um, and this pulls up anything on listening. You can filter results. So um, if you don't want things for kindergarten level, you really only want things for undergrad level, you can click that. Um, if you're really just looking for an individual assignment or a quiz, you can filter based on that. I'm going to leave um, everything except the, the grade level filtered there. Um, and then, I don't know why that filter didn't work. Where is there a return button. I don't know if I'm missing something because I can't see it while I'm screen sharing, but um, anyway, you can. She knows everything. <laughs> yeah, it looks like I clicked on, no. Yeah, so there's um, pages, quizzes, assignments, um, sometimes entire courses. Here's a whole course on listening. Um, and then when you find something you like, I'll just pretend to import my own thing. Uh, click on it. Um, it gives you a rough preview of um, what it is. It's a 50 point assignment submission style. Here's basically what it looks like. By the way, this is way better. It, they didn't used to offer this preview. So now you can have a pretty clear sense for what it is you're <laughs> getting yourself into. Gives you grading rationale, comes with a rubric, um, all that good stuff. So you're like, yep, yep, I want this. So then you click import and then it lets you select which courses you want to import them to or all. So um, you can then choose which particular classes you want to import it to and then click import into course, um, or you can download it. It's way easier to just import it um, and it'll go straight to your, your class. Is that good? Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, so I'm gonna go back over here <clears throat> and go back to student view. Check my tab, okay. So back into modules. Um, 
Okay, so then the rest of this start here module, um, again, is orienting them um, to me as an instructor, um, to the course itself, um, and then uh, I'll use week zero, which I'll talk about in a minute, to orient them a little bit to each other. So one of the questions that I always have to answer is how on earth do you do interpersonal communication online? So I address that for them just in a really quick um, couple paragraphs. Uh, basically, the gist of it is that we're doing more and more of our communication online anyway, and so this gives us a unique opportunity to explore that um, in a really practical way, but it also makes their real world their classroom. So instead of doing a paraphrasing practice with some random classmate, I ask them to actually find someone that they interact with. That'll be a little more tricky this quarter when we're not allowed to interact with people face to face, um, but that they'll have to, they actually use their real world as their classroom and then reflect on it and report on it. Um, so I just give them that sort of justification and overview real quick. Um, and then I orient them to um, what it's like to become an online learner. Um, this is still in process. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to add this quarter is a text survey. Um, normally, when students self-select into online classes, um, I assume that they basically have the technology, um, maybe not all the skills, and so we talk a little bit about uh, becoming an online learner. And I do have a link for um, if this is if you're a new online learner, um, even in my normal quarters. But this quarter, I'm going to add a survey um, that Mark Barrington shared last week um, that asks students a little bit about the technology they have available, their internet connectivity, um, just to try, to try to identify early on those students that might struggle with the technology and be able to reach out to them uh, early on. That's, that's great, um, because in your question about what makes you nervous this quarter, there were a few people who were talking about being nervous about uh, making sure that their students had uh, the um, connections and that it, uh, the ability to keep instruction going and, and connected. So I think there are folks who are not only worrying about their own uh, ability to use it, also very concerned about the students and their experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I think getting that information up front is gonna be really useful. Um, Mark said he'd share it, I haven't seen it yet, so I'm gonna bug him about that. Because <laughs> um, I searched for it on Canvas Commons and didn't see it, but um, and just looking. Andy, I will follow up with him. I think I think I know how to find that. So, <laughs> and the other thing I just wanted to say really quickly is uh, Jay Luke Wood and Frank Harris did a webinar a few weeks ago on um, how to make sure that your learning environments are equitable during COVID nineteen, mm -hmm. and doing a technology survey is also something they mentioned as part of their sort of framework for an equity strategy. And I just mentioned that because um, there's also some comments in the chat around working with historically underserved students of color. Nice. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so this page again just kind of orients them. Um, one of the things that I do touch on is writing because a lot of this class um, is uh, discussion board posting. Um, and I make the point that this isn't really an English class, but that your writing is the primary way that you're making an impression uh, when it's a primarily digital uh, format or dis discussion based format. And they can use videos uh, to post discussions. A lot of them don't, uh, or at least they haven't in the past. I'm curious to see if that changes this quarter with everyone using Zoom and video chat for everything they're doing. Um, <laughs> but I do make just a little note about writing. Um, and then again, reminding them, um, I put this asking questions at the bottom of most every page in this first week or two, um, just to remind them <clears throat> how to get, get answers to their questions and that I welcome their questions, that I'm here, that I'm responsive, um, that I am open to them asking. Um, getting to know your instructor, um, I added this page, uh, or not added, uh, updated, that's what the word I'm looking for, added more pictures to this page than I had before. Um, and again, this is an opportunity for me to um, share a little bit about me um, and get a little bit of my personality out there, um, let them see that I'm human. Um, one of the things that I was really worried about when I first started teaching was that teacher presence. Um, so much of the way that I teach is based on that face-to-face um, -face connection and rapport that I build with my students. And so um, 
I was from the very beginning looking for these ways to um, create that sense of connection and, and personableness to the classes that I was teaching online. So this is one of the ways that I've done that and just um, putting some silly, funny um, pictures and then also encouraging them to provide me with feedback. Um, so what's working for you and what's not um, and just letting them know that I'm trying things out too and some of these are things that I know have worked in the past and some of them may not work this time um, and just inviting them to be part of that conversation with me um, just to kind of build again a, a better sense of community. Um, and then the module continues with um, syllabus so I um, I add this sort of placeholder page just as a way to um, get them to access the syllabus. I use the syllabus um, structure in Canvas because it automatically makes it more accessible um, and includes a calendar at the bottom without me having to generate it. So once all the assignments with the due dates are in there, um, that calendar is generated for students on the syllabus tool. Um, but I want to direct their attention to it. And so I just add this really, really simple syllabus page. Go check out the syllabus so that they, they see that. Um, and then I introduce them to the textbooks. Um, they're all OER resources, and um, I don't usually assign a full chapter at one time, so I want them to be able to find certain sections that I want them to read. So I have this page that kind of introduces them to that. And then um, I use a Golden Lines concept where um, a lot of the discussions are around uh, what stood out to you from the reading and why. Um, and sometimes it's a really uh, general what stood out. Sometimes I ask them to look for certain things, um, something they agreed with or something they disagreed with, um, something that raised confusion for them. Um, but I want them to be introduced to this idea of golden lines and, and how to um, read text, whether it's digital or, um, or print, paper print, um, <clears throat> and kind of how to make the most of their reading time. So that's part of that uh, orientation module. Um, and then here's that question corner page. They can access this either from modules or from um, this uh, navigation link on the side. So again, showed all of those in there. Um, I also created a few FAQs at the bottom. This um, grows a little bit every quarter, but things like how do I tell if my assignment submission went through? How do I use a deadline extension? Um, I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, and how can I view feedback on assignments and quizzes? So just those common questions that you end up getting asked a lot. And they're um, just uh, screenshot videos that walk students through what it looks like on their screen when they're looking for feedback or checking to see if an assignment's been submitted. Um, one of the things that I always do is um, include this questions for the instructor discussion forum. Um, I think I'm going to add a picture to this so that it feels a little more personable. Um, but this is the place that I hope that they will ask general course questions, uh, deadlines, assignment instructions, broken links, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I tell them why I want them to ask the questions here, um, both because they're not the only person with that question um, and because then they can help each other out. Again, that's a sense of building community with each other, um, giving them that opportunity to um, be the expert once in a while and not always be the one with the question, um, but also getting answers faster than waiting around for me to come back to it. Um, I always tell them it'll be within 24 hours, but um, sometimes they have a classmate that's on right now working on an assignment that knows the answer. And so um, this tends to be a pretty great place for them to um, share questions and uh, help each other, but also a centrally located spot for me to answer all those general questions. One of the things that often happens in the first week or two of the quarter is that students will send me a lot of these questions through inbox and I will answer their question in inbox and then tell them, hey, will you please post this on questions for the instructor for me, because I'm sure other people will be wondering this as well. Um, and it helps to kind of validate that they've asked a good question, um, reminds them that I really want those kinds of questions going to that discussion forum. Um, and then I'll post that same response that I gave them in Canvas inbox on the questions for the instructor forum so that everyone can see it. Um, again, not only does that help that student, but it helps model for other students, hey, this is what this looks like, and you can ask your questions here too. Um, so I try to make that a priority for students to do. Being slow. And then one of the, and honestly, this 
very rarely gets much use. Um, I'll see if it gets much use this quarter, um, but I'm committed to leaving it here just in case. Um, it's a student lounge. I tell them that it's it's an unmonitored space for them to have the kind of off-topic conversations that they might uh, before and after class, in a face-to-face -face class, to plan study sessions, um, to just do whatever they want. And I do have access to see it, but I am not monitoring it. And so um, I tell them not to post questions for me here, um, but that they can chat with each other here and again, even though um, it doesn't get a lot of use, I think just even having it there as an option um, promotes this idea of um, being a community and um, connecting with each other that I think is really valuable. Okay, I'm gonna go back over to modules for a second um, so that again, you can see that that's all, all those things are laid out in this um, start here module. Um, and then one of the things that our college does is uh, what they call a week zero. So they open all of the online classes a week ahead of time. Um, and it's an opportunity for students to kind of get started with the technology, um, get oriented to the class, uh, see how things are working, practice with some of the tools and things that they'll need to use. Um, and so what I did is built this week zero um, success strategies module that introduces students to a lot of the things that they'll need to be able to do, um, like submitting assignments, posting to discussion boards, accessing content, um, even taking quizzes. So it's a syllabus quiz down here. Um, and to entice them to participate in these activities, I offer extra credit so that even before this, the quarter has started, they can earn points up front. Um, and this is that sort of low stakes idea where um, it's not a ton of points. You don't have to give them very much extra credit to get them to do something, um, but it gives them an early sense of success um, and mastery of what's going on. And rather than just being a generic, um, here's how to use the tool, I embed success strategies in those, um, those learning modules. So uh, a page about successful versus struggling students and some of the characteristics just to kind of set the scene um, for what some of those things look like. And then um, again, the sense of community building is I ask them or offer extra credit for them if they will update their profile and then submit a screenshot. Um, and again, this is an example of um, not only community building, but also a way to introduce them to how, how does it work to update your profile? Um, how do I take a screenshot and submit that as an assignment on Canvas so that they're um, learning how to do all of this? So here's the submit button and all the instructions for how to do that. I just realized I don't have a due date. I need to edit that. <laughs> As long as you're on due dates, there there is a question about the deadline extension feature yeah, in yeah. Canvas. Yeah. So um, I my late policy is that um, assignments can be turned in up to a week late. Um, but they'll get grade deductions and the grade penalties are harsher for discussion posts because um, those are your classmates are relying on you to do your original post before they can then do their um, responsive comments. And so um, those and, and quizzes have um, sort of harsher penalties. So um, one of the things that I do is I leave this week zero module up all quarter um, so that at any point in time that a student feels like they need extra credit, they can do these extra credit assignments because they're still learning things about learning styles or um, stress management or time management, um, but they can only earn the deadline extensions if they did them um, during the first week or during week zero or the first week of the quarter. So by that deadline. And, and what so it does is gives students a kind of a free pass um, one time during the quarter to submit a discussion posting late and have it graded as full credit or to submit an assignment late and have it graded as full credit um, or to submit a quiz late again within that one week time frame, um, but to have it earn full credit. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so Andy, um, Mary was also asking, a, I, I guess it's a mechanical or logistics question. She says that she's been trying to monitor that manually and it would be wonderful if it were something that could be automated. Do you know anything about that? No, I, I mean, yeah, that would be great, but I don't know any way to automate that, um, especially okay. because they're gonna use it in a bunch of different ways. Um, what I do, I'll go back to that. Um, how to use a deadline extension. Oh, it's a video, so it's not going to show very easily because I don't think I can share the audio. I might be able to share the audio. 
Let me see here. Um, you should be able to share the audio. Okay. I don't know if you want to watch the whole video anyway, but um, this how do I use a deadline extension tells students what I want them to do. Um, and so uh, when I grade their extra credit assignment, I send them a congratulations, you earned a deadline extension message. I copy and paste it from a Google Doc. So um, it's super, super easy and fast to you know, send that congratulations message to every student. And then that lives as a submission comment in the gradebook. Um, and then when a student wants to cash that in, they need to leave me a submission comment on the assignment they want to use it for um, that alerts me that they want to use it. And so um, that way, when I go to grade that assignment, it's all there on SpeedGrader. I can see their comment that they want to use the deadline extension. So then I just go back to the grade book and double check that they have a deadline extension for that type of assignment and then add a comment to the original comment um, that says deadline extension applied to so I know once they've used it because it shows up in the grade book and I, I don't know how to show that because um, I this is a course that I actually have students in yeah. and yeah. so I can't show the grade book but um, if you click on a student's score on the grade book, it'll show you all of the submission comment thread for that assignment. And so I just post the comments there and it's the easiest way I've found to keep track of that. And it actually is pretty simple, pretty easy to do. But it's not automated, unfortunately. Um, okay. So, so that's, um, week one and week zero, or uh, the orientation welcome module and week zero. And then week one is sort of the um, first official week of the quarter. And turn check my time here. Um, again, I try to be um, relatively light this first week, but still introduce them to the basic tools that they're gonna need. So I start with an overview um, again, this is every single week, even in the week zero module, there's one of these overviews. Tells them which course objective or course learning outcome we're working toward, um, a little preview of some of the topics that we're going to be looking at, and then a to-do list. And I hyperlink a lot of things um, so that they can get to them pretty easily. Um, but I also remind them that they should work through each module in order. Um, this little reminder down here. Uh, but it gives them a pretty clear um, to-do list that they know exactly what they need to do and it's in order of deadline um, or sort of in order of the progression through the week that they should use um, <clears throat> so that they have a clear sense for what they need to do. And then they can navigate it by clicking next. So um, they've got a content page where um, there's some video, there's some narration from me, some images to break up the text. Um, just kind of working your way through. Um, when I want students to read something out of the textbook, I use this icon. So every single time they see this icon, they're going to be getting an assignment to read out of the textbook. And because it's an OER, I can hyperlink straight to it, which is kind of nice, um, and remind them to be keeping track of golden lines for discussions later on. So I want to let someone else voice some of the chat here. I'm just really interested in um, some of the questions. And as long as you're on images, Joanna Yee asked a question about where you're getting your images and um, how, how you work uh, with the copyright and privacy issues. Yeah, so most of the time I try to use images that are um, uh, licensed for reuse. Um, which you can find by Googling. Um, I'll show you, let's look for an image of community just for kicks on Google. Um, and if you click tools and, oh, I gotta click images first. Um, and then click tools and usage rights. You can click labeled for non-commercial reuse. Um, and that brings up any images that are um, able to be used by anyone. Um, the other thing is that if you link out to something and not just embed it, um, you can use almost anything that's published to the web as long as you're linking out, not having it live there. Um, so videos, 
um, that are like here, for example, um, it's embedded from the actual YouTube link. So I didn't download it and upload it as my own video. It's connected to that external link. Um, so you're allowed to use anything that's publicly available online. And, and Alyssa put in the chat, the open attribution builder, she put the link in there for folks. And I also put in a link to Unsplash, which has a lot of free images, and also the link to Creative Commons with Flickr. Um, awesome. Yeah, so this is exciting. I'm trying to get. I'm glad we're covering this. So one of the um, assignments from the first week is um, introductions, and again, this is that community building. So um, I ask them to introduce themselves to each other. Um, post to the discussion thread and then comment with each other. And I connected a little bit. We um, start talking a little bit about personality sorting. And so I ask them um, to talk a little bit about what they thought was true and not true about their personality sorting. Um, and then I ask them what is something they're really good at. They don't know it yet, but this will come back in um, weeks two and three when we start talking about developing communication competence and sense of identity. Um, and so this kind of sets them up for later, but um, also is a positive way to kind of get conversation started and find commonality um, and build community in students with each other. Uh, and then the second discussion for the week. Um, so this week one has two discussions and a, a quiz. Um, so it's a fairly light week. Um, and this is just an open golden lines discussion. What stood out to you for any reason? And um, I tell them um, pretty clearly what I want their discussion post to look like and give them an example. Um, and then responses. And again, it follows that Canvas week. So post by midnight Saturday, respond by midnight Monday so that they're starting to get used to that rhythm. Um, gives them grading criteria and deadlines. Um, and there is a rubric that's attached as well. Um, and then the quiz. And this just is kind of a reading check quiz. Um, so they're relatively short quizzes that they'll do. I'm um, usually nine or 10 questions, between eight and 10 questions, um, just to keep them on track with the information each week. Uh, so I want to go back here really quick. Um, and um, just a reminder that um, we uh, I think one of the best things we can do is build a sense of community um, and honor the context. And um, the more that you can give them some grace, uh, they'll probably give that right back to you. So um, validate that they're anxious and you are too, and that um, the best way to get through it is to just try to do it together. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Andy, before we wrap up, um, I, I just wanted to ask one quick question, and um, I was I was a little tuned out because I was finding the tech survey. So um, I wanted to thank uh, Joe. Thanks for womaning the chat. Um, a Brooke asked if you are basically listing everything twice, once in the overview and then age link in the module, and she says um, that's a lot of work. And I guess I was just wondering, what is your take on what's your take on that? Is it a good investment of time? Um, I, I think it is uh, in the sense that I think um, everything you can do um, to help them stay on track is really useful. Um, but if you just do the overview without the links, that's okay too. Um, one of the things that I do wanna show you though is that building these links is actually super, super easy. Um, it is actually easier than typing it in. Um, so I'm going to show you that really, really quick so that um, you can see. <clears throat> so once you have the content pages built, um, <clears throat> you can hyperlink to all kinds of stuff <clears throat> using this, this bar section over here. And you don't even have to type it in. So let's say that I also want them to read uh, or to visit the questions for the instructor discussion. If I click on discussions, it pulls up all the discussions for the quarter. I'm going to scroll down to questions for the instructor. I click on it and it puts the text and the hyperlink in without me even having to do anything except click. So it's actually easier to build a hyperlinked list than to type the list of what they need to do. Um, nice. And I think it's useful for them to have an overview all on one page that is a little bit more detailed than just the modules. Um, and I, I recommend that students actually print this out 
and literally check it off. I've, I've been searching for ways to make these bullets look like check boxes, and I, I can't find a way to do it in Canvas. Um, so that they can literally use check boxes here. Um, but it, it, I think it's worth the investment because it's actually really easy. Perfect. That's great. I think there's a couple of follow up questions in the chat. Um, so one is from Brooke. Uh, she said, cool, didn't know that. Can we do that when adding to the module and not a page? Um, sort of. So um, you can all add almost anything to a module. Um, this is my unpublished module of all my announcements. So I've got announcements for each week and I save those so that I don't have to reinvent the wheel every quarter. Um, so I'm gonna just play with this module for a second. So you can add almost anything to a module. Um, you can add a quiz, you can add a file, you can add a page, um, you can add a discussion. One of the things that I didn't know about early on that I really like now is text headers. Um, so if that's what you're asking, and then if you click assignments, they're all here, um, and you just choose which one you wanna add. I'll add practice and assertiveness, and there it is in there, like that. Um, text headers are cool. They are not a link. Um, they're like this one here that says resources. Um, it doesn't link to anything. It's not a page. It's just a text header that helps divide it. So I use that um, not in week zero, but starting in week one um, to separate the lessons from the assignments. Uh, those little text headers and they just help organize the module a little bit. They don't show up when students are clicking through the pages though. And Alyssa's reminding us that those text headers are helpful when viewing the course in the student app. Mm -hmm. ah. cool. Absolutely. Um, I love text headers. <laughs> One of my favorite things. Yeah. Um, Andy, there's another question. Is the only real-time synchronous work involved for your online class your virtual office hours and due dates? Yes. Um, and that was a pretty intentional decision early on that I'm actually um, glad that I made. Uh, and every quarter I toy with the idea of doing something synchronously. Um, but the decision that I made early on was that um, online was intended to be really flexible timing for students. Um, and that sort of the whole point of it was that students with really crazy schedules could do the work at 2 a.m. if they needed to or um, while their kids are you know, hanging on them at home because they're homeschooling them this quarter. <laughs> um, and so everything is done asynchronously on their own time. Um, the only thing that keeps it um, paced are the deadlines. So they can post to that discussion board uh, anytime prior to the deadline. Uh, they will need to come back and post their responses within that, that window of time. Um, but yeah, I don't do anything synchronously in my online class. And again, for me, I think it's an equity issue. Um, it, it feels uncomfortable for me to expect that, especially this quarter, um, that students are gonna have the right level of connectivity at the right time of day um, and the right level of skill to be comfortable and then actually learn anything while they're focused on trying to master the technology. Um, so I've made everything asynchronous. Beautiful response, Andy. Um, I think uh, Joanna w is asking if you could show again how to place a hyperlink. Um, but before you do that, um, I did. I did want to say um, also. So if you could redo how to do a post or how to do a hyperlink, and then also there's a question from Jonathan Harrington asking if a student would like to do a video post to a discussion board, what's the best tool for doing that? Um, he's asking if they can use Panopto and create a link, but I think there's better tools. Yeah. Um, okay. So let me show the link, and then I'll talk about the um, the video thing. So again, real quick. Um, the way that you add a hyperlink is this bar over here on the right hand side is your bestest friend. Uh, so anytime you want, and, and what's cool about it is that when you um, import this course, like from fall quarter to winter quarter, um, the links update with 
fit. So you don't have to go and change all these hyperlinks every quarter. If you use this, this navigation tool over here, it will automatically update them. So let's say that I want to hyperlink to a particular quiz. I'll just drop down, add the quiz, and it adds it in there. Oh, I've got it set to 24 points, so it's really big. Um, but I can change that. Like I can go back then and change the look of that text if I want to. I can make it small. Um, I can change all kinds of things and it still functions as a hyperlink. And I didn't type anything, I just clicked a button. I love it. All right, we're gonna cancel that. And then, um, so as far as posting videos to discussions, um, Actually, hold on, I want to be in student view. Um, I think one of the easiest ways that I usually recommend is that they just use the uh, media recording tool right in Canvas. Um, just because they don't then have to use any other tools or technology or go anywhere else uh, to make that happen. So if I go to introductions. <clears throat> um, and I actually give them extra credit if they will post it as a video. Um, and I show them right here how to do that. Um, <clears throat> there's a little icon when they go to post that is a video record, a video or audio recording uh, tool. And so if they click on their post here and then click on record upload media, um, it'll just record it right in that um, discussion board. It doesn't save it anywhere on their phone. They don't have to deal with um, editing or adding it to YouTube or adding a link or any of that. So that's usually what I recommend to them. Um, I do have uh, attachment options for them. So if they have a YouTube video that they want to use or they took it on their um, their cell phone and they have just a regular video file, they can attach that as another option. Um, but I usually encourage them to use this just because it's so simple. Anything else? This is really, really wonderful. And um, Laura Manning, Hi, Laura. Um, I love all the communication folks in here. Uh, she writes, for what it's worth, I've been experimenting with Loom.com and I love it. Download the app. The premium version, version is free with a .edu email address. Click the record button. And when you stop recording, the video is saved to the cloud. So you get a URL you can paste anywhere. Students have been pretty savvy about figuring it out and have pasting and uh, pasting in the link. The premium version includes the same cool editing functions that I hope to use for a class project creating a cultural identity video. Thanks, uh, Laura. That sounds awesome. Um, dreaming especially... big, Jen. Uh, hi. Hi, Say Mama. Something. Talk yeah, I'm just saying, I'm dreaming big. <laughs> I think that's great. I love the idea of a class project creating a cultural identity video. Cool. I yeah. hope it works out. Thanks for, well, we, we will, we'll have to do another uh, Lifeboat Strategies follow-up where you tell us how it worked because oh, it sounds God. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great. Thanks, Laura. Um, so Dina is saying, thank you, Andy. And um, Dina, I will be sending um, everyone who gave me their email address, address um, a direct email with all the links to the slide deck and the recording, um, but also they will be posted to kind of like the standing page that I have for the lifeboat strategies. And I also found Mark's survey link. So I put that into the chat and I put that on the, um, uh, sorry, I put that on the chat and I also will put it on the follow up document. And um, Andy, people are weighing in and saying, thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. I'm so happy to share. Um, please reach out if you have any other questions or um, concerns or want ideas or want to brainstorm together. Um, I love this stuff. So, And also, yeah. I, I do want to ask, I know we do have a lot of co uh, communications faculty online and, you know, I have been organizing discipline specific communities of practice. Um, and I'm seeing like Brooke wrote in, Brooke Zimmers from Shoreline wrote in and asked for your email so she could do follow up questions. But I'm wondering if it's useful for the communications faculty to have a, a like a maybe a once every two weeks just online meeting so folks can share what they're doing. Um, if folks would be interested in that, uh, do let me know. Um, oh, Laura says that would be great. <laughs> um, Joe, uh, 
I think all of us, uh, Joe, what do you want to say? I, I, I'm just listening. I'm so happy with this session. I do want to invite folks to any communities of practice that they want to join. <laughs> just, I'm excited that they're <laughs> yeah. happy want to encourage and and also want to let folks that there will know that there will be some sort of topic specific ones as well that they can maybe join into a discussion with folks from other disciplines although I know right now like the, the most important thing is just to connect with your your people who teach your same discipline yeah I want to read what Marsha Horton wrote. Marsha wrote, this presentation was amazingly helpful. Thank you, Andy. You and are so welcome. Yeah, Andy, I really appreciate your beautiful slide deck and complementing it with specific things from your beautifully designed course. And I also want you to know, too, I really love the way that you talk about, you know, like your interpersonal communications assignment where mm -hmm. you've made the their real lives a laboratory. And when you were saying about, you know, kind of whatever the observation is, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, think of all the interpersonal interactions that are happening right now on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. <clears throat> It's, uh, I, I have a feeling that I'm going to be asked less often how it is that interpersonal can be taught online because now we, we know that we do interpersonal communication from a distance that you don't have to be face to face. So I feel like that's a question I'll get asked less often now, but who knows. <laughs> well, it's one of those. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joanna. Yeah. Sorry. Before we go, did I understand correctly because we're going to get uh somewhere some point and i think i heard there's some uh someone said about uh we're going to get this kind of sample to fill up what andy's teaching would be like so headline either or the uh, short contents did i understand it uh, clearly we'll be getting some sample of it yes so we will be able to view her somewhere in this, how she teaches. and Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. So Andy is going to upload her courses. Andy, you tell me if I'm saying this right. Uh, Andy's going to upload her courses to the Canvas Commons, and then you will be able to find her course in the Canvas Commons. Oh, great. Thank does you. That, does that make sense? Yeah, that's what I was asking. That's what I oh, think beautiful. I heard. <laughs> beautiful, Thank beautiful. You. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Andy. Fantastic presentation. That was really great. Thanks. And I Alyssa, everybody, um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Of course. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, first of all, Andy, thank you so much for doing this. It's so helpful. Uh, I was only able to join about 10 minutes ago because I had uh, technical difficulties. I was unable to access my Outlook email and help desk hasn't been able to help me with that yet. Um, so I finally just joined a few minutes ago and wanted to ask, will there be a recording available of this whole meeting mm -hmm. later and where would I be able to access that? Because I know I missed a lot. And again, thank you for doing this because it looks like it's very, very helpful. Yeah, um, just make sure you put your email address in the chat bar. And then Jen, I think, is going to send out, or Alyssa, someone from SBCTC is going to send out the recording. OK, great. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm sorry. I know how hard it is when you're trying to get into your Outlook. And like, it just seems like when you most need the tech, everything fails. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Joe did a, an amazing Please. work, uh, Joe Monroe, who was on this call, did an amazing workshop this morning on working remotely from home. And I've been doing using my tech all the time and everything fell apart. So I was like unmuted during her session Ooh. and it was very embarrassing. And <laughs> no, we, we kind of liked it. It was, the, the thing was when Tim was going cat, 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 that was kind <laughs> of interesting. But what we liked about it was it was about remote work remote working and mental health so it really was trying to support each other through all these kinds of things and um yeah it, it we were we were just working at working together right <laughs> that's very gracious joe <laughs> i was like oh goodness well anyway um thank you so much everyone oh and also just really quickly laura is posting to the chat that there's a Facebook group called Calm Studies Online Pandemic Group. So definitely check that out. And um, Andy, again, um, I just wanted to say to you, 
during all the lifeboat strategy sessions you've been womaning the chat you've been jumping on and just answering questions and offering insights and so i'm so grateful to you for being willing to dedicate this much time and effort um, to sharing more with this larger community thank you so much no problem. And we know where you ride, so we're going to find you. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to help. Happy to help. All right. So I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.